Welcome to the Introduction to Geographic Information Systems and Science Lecture Series developed by the Quinney College of Natural Resources at Utah State University. Discussion topics for this lecture include data classification techniques, tables, and table properties. When using or manipulating GIS or geospatial data, it's optimal that we classify our data into groups or categories to better display that data. Classification is often defined as the process of sorting or arranging entities into groups or categories on a map, thereby making it easier to understand and interpret. Classification techniques that are often discussed with respect to GIS include natural breaks, quantile breaks, equal interval breaks, standard deviation, or a manual option that allows a user to input manually defined breaks. When we speak of these breaks, we're talking about the classes that we divide the data into so that we can easily display it for visual purposes on a map. The following slides will use the same data set, the 2000 population census data for the lower 48 states, and show that data in four different classification methods. The first method shown here is what we call natural breaks using a jinx optimization. Natural breaks is a data classification method that partitions data into classes based on natural groups or groupings in the data distribution. Natural breaks that occur in the data are called valleys and breaks in those data are considered class breaks. In the natural breaks example here you can see the population data displayed for the lower 48 states with California, Texas, Florida, and New York having higher population and the western or midwestern states having lower populations. We can see five natural breaks in this data. Using the same data with a quantile break, we can see that our data distribution or the appearance of our data distribution changes. Quantile breaks are data classification methods that distributes a set of values into groups that contain an equal number of values. In this case, we have five different groupings. Each one of those groups has the same number of values. Each class contains an equal number of observations and we can display in quartile or quintile four or five category groups. Note the differences from the previous slide to this one. In this previous slide we can see that we have high populations for California, Texas, Florida, and some of the northeastern states. In the quantile break classification method we can see that we have breaks that are more significantly defined for California, Texas, Florida, Georgia, and some of the northeastern states. We can also start to see that our lower populated states, such as Montana, Wyoming, and North De and South Dakota, actually fall into our lower category, whereas Idaho, Utah, and Nevada are now in the mid-level. The next type of classification method is what we call equal interval breaks. Equal interval classifications are methods that divide a set of attribute values into groups that contain equal ranges of values. In this case, you can see that our data is now divided with equally spaced classes in the bottom right, looking at the histogram. But our data distribution, or at least the view of our data distribution, has changed substantially. It now appears that we have a number of low populated states, with our highest populations being in California, Texas, Florida, and New York. This method is best applied when the user is very familiar with the data content, and it's important to note that any one of these data techniques must be applied carefully so that the user truly understands the nature of the data. The next type of classification method is called a standard deviation break. Standard deviation classification methods find the mean value and then place class breaks above and below that mean at intervals of either a quarter, half, or one standard deviation until all data values are contained within the classes. Values that are beyond the three standard deviations from the mean are aggregated into two classes greater than three standard deviations. These are often known as outliers. In this case, you can see our population data, our western states, and a few of the far northeastern states are now classified in a negative 0.5 standard deviations from the mean. If we look at the states in blue, California, Texas, Florida, and New York, we can see that those states are 1.5 standard deviations above the mean value. When using standard deviation breaks, it's important that the user understand how the data is being displayed. Moving on, we'll begin our discussion of tables. A table is a two-dimensional array of rows and columns where we store our attribute data. Tables really hold the quantitative and qualitative information about spatial data. When talking about a table, each row represents a single record. On your screen you can see an example of an attribute table for a shape file of counties. Each column represents a field and each row represents a single record. 
Again, rows represent records, whereas columns represent fields. Fields are known as object properties or attributes. In this case, each row is the name of a county. Each county has a series of attributes, including a FIPS code, the area of that county, population information, population change, household, and so on. As previously mentioned, each spatial feature is linked to an entry in the table containing information about that feature. So as you can see our example here, we have three states highlighted, Washington, Montana, and Idaho, and each one of those states has a series of attributes that describe that spatial data. When we're discussing tables in ArcMap, there's two different types. There's a feature attribute table, and then there's a standalone table. The feature attribute table stores attribute data of spatial features and is associated with a spatial data layer. The FAT also has special fields for spatial information including an FID or feature ID and a shape field identifying what the shape type is, point, line, or polygon. A standalone table, on the other hand, stores any type of tabular data but is not necessarily inherently associated with a spatial data set. Other than an FID, this standalone table contains an OID or an object ID field as a unique identifier. When we're discussing GIS, there's a number of different database types. Tables we've been discussing are loosely defined as a type of database. Within the GIS, often here reference to flat files, which are not a true database, certainly have attributes that attribute them to being similar to a database, a hierarchical database, or a relational database. Flat files are files that store data in rows of information in a single file. These flat files are very simple to understand, they're easy to build, easy to update. However, the files have no real relationship with other files, so there's no interlinking between these files within a basic database structure. These flat files are inefficient for searches and queries because the large files become cumbersome and sometimes unstable and difficult to use. An example of this is a Microsoft Excel sheet, which is a type of a flat file. A hierarchical database is a database that stores data in multiple tables in a tree-like form. Tables have a defined parent-child relationship and each parent may have many children, but children may only have one parent. Hierarchical databases are very efficient for specific types of queries. The hierarchical database structure is not logical for geographic features. Hierarchical databases cannot define new linkages between records once the tree is defined. Structures may require duplication of data and is highly storage inefficient. The last type of database that we'll discuss, and is very common in GIS, is a relational database. A relational database is a database structure in which a collection of tables are logically associated with each other by shared fields. Relational databases are often used in GIS. This is because it is sometimes more efficient to not store all of the attributes in one single feature attribute table. Separate tables can reduce redundancy. Updates to spatial and tabular components can be made separately, making updating and changing the tables much more simple. GIS data models can be so complex that a single table is sometimes not sufficient. Some relational database terms that you're often likely to hear. Discussing relational database, there's some terms that you're likely to hear. The basic unit of a relational database is considered a table, similar to a flat file. Tables include destination tables and source tables, containing different types of information or data. And tables are generally linked via relations between what we call keys, and we can have primary or foreign keys. A primary key is an attribute or set of attributes in a database that uniquely identify each record and is used to match to a foreign key in another table. Now these unique identifiers are not unique to relational databases and are in fact used in both hierarchical and flat files. A foreign key is an attribute or a set of attributes in one table that match the primary key attribute in another table. So a destination table is a table that can relate or be joined with information from a source table using a primary key. The source table is a table that has some attributes that may be related back to a des destination table using a foreign key. In this case, we have a common key called code. We have a destination table and a source table. And if we link those two using code, we can attribute more information to each row. In this example, you can see the potential complexity of a relational database. However, the complexity actually creates a more elegant storage of data, allowing us to better query and extract data from the database.